Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this lesson, this series of lessons, is on the book of Psalms. This is lesson number 10 in that series for March 9 of 2024, entitled Lessons of the Past. Hmm. Think of what you know about the Psalms and try to imagine what it says about the past. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we have learned some marvelous things from the book of Psalms in this series of lessons, and we want to thank you so much. Be with us now as we see another whole different aspect of the book of Psalms and what we should be learning from it. May that be clear to us in our study today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. Do you think there are lessons that we can learn from history? <laughs> How's the statement go? If you can't learn from history, you're yeah. bound to repeat it. Yeah. <laughs> are we doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past if they fail to study, to study our prior failures and learn from those errors? Our Bible study guide says, Jim? In numerous Psalms, praise takes the form of narrate, narrating the Lord's mighty acts of salvation. These psalms are often called salvation history psalms or historical psalms. Some appeal to God's people, telling them to learn from their, their history, particularly from their mistakes and the mistakes of their ancestors. Certain historical psalms t contain a predominant hymnal oh. note that highlights God's past wonderful deeds on behalf of God's people and that strengthens their trust in the Lord, who is able and faithful to deliver them from their present hardships. The special appeal to the historical psalm is that they help us to see our lives as part of the history of God's people and to claim that past, claim that past as our own. Are we, as we, excuse me, as we have been adopted into the family of the historic people of, excuse me, Okay. historic people of the God through Christ in Romans and Galatians. The historical heritage of the ancient people of Israel is indeed the account of our spiritual ancestry. Therefore, we can and should learn from their past, which is ours as well, from the Bible. Story and Bible. I might add that um, one particular church has really tried to adopt that idea very strongly. Do you know which church that is? Christian church, the biggest Christian so church. That was Catholic, obviously. And they say that the the history of the Bible from beginning to end was done by the by Chris, the Christian basically heritage down through the years, and so therefore the Pope today has just as much authority to possibly change that if necessary as these, those original writers. This is just one continuous um, collection of famous authorities. Since you're making the statement, um, he has decided that the scriptures are obsolete and we're going to have a new one. Mm -hmm. This is... <laughs> yeah. Well, in several of his letters, Paul picked up the theme that we are talking about and reminded us that in God's eyes, Every one of us who is a faithful follower becomes a part of the descendants of Abraham and can call out to God as our father. Um, and there are probably the most famous places, this one in Romans 8, 15. For the spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the spirit makes you God's children. And by the spirit, spirit's power, we cry out to God, Father, my father. There are other passages, of course, but that's an obvious one. And Galatians as well. We're supposed to recognize that each generation of people is intended to add something to the story of the great controversy. I mean, shouldn't each generation pro give some additional insights into the great controversy? Multiple Psalms in the book talk about marvelous things that God has done for his people in the past. Some main focuses you could imagine, written in the Psalms, of course, that was back, focused around the days of David, include the plagues of Egypt, 
the Exodus, the entrance into the land of Canaan, and conquering the enemies there. So you could, you could imagine that these would be considered to be major historical events in the eyes of the psalmists who are writing at that time. But they also recognized how unfaithful the people almost always were. Stop and weep. By contrast, they ask us to look back at the stories of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And obviously, those are marvelous pillars back there in the beginning. God is praising, is praised for caring for the children of Israel through their wilderness wanderings. He gave them manna from heaven and water out of a rock. They ate angels' food, but as time went by, they turned away from God, and then some of them died, and suddenly others, in various times, various times, suddenly others recognized that they needed to turn back to him. The Reformation did not last very long. So if you want to, you want to review that a little bit, read Judges. One, two, three. It just blow you away. In Psalm 78, the plagues on Egypt are mentioned in considerable detail. In fact, if you <clears throat> look carefully at the Psalms, you'll discover that you learn things about the Exodus, about the plagues, and things that happen in the wilderness. More, some details, which like the idea that it's angels' food. That's not found in Exodus. It's found in Psalms. Not all stories are ideal. The psalmist mentioned that the covenant box, the Ark of the Lord, was captured by the Philistines because it was taken into battle by the sons of Levi. And that was a terrible... Eli. 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 Did I say? Levi. You were close. Levi. Oh, sorry, Eli. <laughs> no worries. One of the great times in Israelite history was during the reign of David. We can understand that. The psalmist called people to look back to the good times. And is it a mistake if we try to sort of glaze over the bad times and focus on the good times? Should we do that? Of course, in the Adventist church, we don't have any bad times, right? <laughs> Question is, do we have good times? Yes. We have some good times. It's, it's obvious leadership makes a difference. Yeah. Look at David. Yeah. And then look at his son. Yeah. Within a few years. In the Psalms, the stories are used similar to how Jesus used parables to teach important lessons. So, I mean, what do we use history for in schools today? Is it just entertainment? <laughs> And you see with some of these men on street interviews, you wonder what they've been taught or <laughs> what they're even doing, what's going on right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So obviously, you, stories are supposed to teach us something. And when we talk about the Bible, the entire thing, it's not just history, it's his story. Right. We, need to, we need to remember that. So each lesson, and this is what we do we have done many times, some of us together, um, read through the Bible and ask the one central question is what? What does it what say about it? God? What does it say about God? That's the way the Bible needs to be read. So, but despite God's unending love and abundant forgiveness, the children of Israel kept turning against him. They rebelled and forgot his covenant with them. And... I, I, I stop asking myself a question which maybe I shouldn't. But it seems to me that in studying a great controversy, you need to know at least something about both sides. And what, what methods has Satan used to draw us away from God, to deceive us, to get us to sin? Uh, what, what kind of hooks does he have in us? He has different hooks. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying they're just one. Hmm. Well, what, what have we learned from our personal experience with God? Why did it take so long for the Israelites to realize that whenever they followed God's advice, things worked out perfectly? However, when they departed from His advice, disaster struck them. 
How many times do you think it should have taken for them to learn that lesson? They were too egocentric and thought everything's because of what I do. It's not because of what God does. That's what and they you, thought. And you go to war and you lose hundreds, maybe thousands of people and you come back and you brag about what you did? I, I don't know. I mean, I understand what you're saying. In Psalm 105, the psalmist moves, and in this lesson, we're going to look at several psalms in some detail. Psalms 105 recalls key oh, events. Hold on just a minute. The psalmist moves back and forth in history to talk about the experiences of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Okay, that's what we're going to look for. He reminded them that from the deepest levels of poverty, famine, and, and want, some of them rose to the highest levels in government. Can you think of someone who rose very quickly from the deepest pit almost to the highest levels? Joseph. Joseph, Joseph is an obvious example. I mean, and, and Jacob, think of him running away from home, ba almost basically penniless, and look what happened. It took, it took 20 years, but by the time he came back, he was, I mean, but especially Joseph, I mean, that was just amazing. So the psalmist reminded, well, I mentioned that already. Uh, Joseph and Moses are, are discussed in some detail. And if we had time, we would go back and read Psalm 105. We don't. But comments about it, go ahead. Psalm 105 recalls the events that shaped the covenantial, covenantal relationship between the Lord and his people, Israel. It focuses on God's covenant with Abraham to give the promised land to him and his descendants, and how this promise confirmed to Isaac and Jacob was providentially fulfilled through Joseph, Moses and Aaron, and the time of the conquest of Canaan. The psalm gives hope to God's people in all generations because God's marvelous works in the past guarantees God's uh, unchanging love to his people in all times. Wow. Psalm 105 is an important lesson, encouraging us to look at the stories of the great patriarchs of the past, such as Abraham, Jacob, and Joseph, and emulate their examples. But the psalmist also reminds us that God's promises are for people throughout the earth, and throughout the history, I might add, of the earth. Paul picked up this theme in Galatians 3, 28 and 29, one of my favorite verses. Gordon? So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles. This is a Pharisee saying this? Yes. Between slaves and free people, between men and women. Oh, boy. You a are male Pharisee. Yes. <laughs> you are all one in union with Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Good News Bible. Okay, now, as a young person, what was God's, what was Abraham, maybe, what was Paul's, Saul in those days, what was his message? Thank God that I am a Jew, a male, and not a woman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that was his morning prayer. <laughs> okay, and and basically, they were, they were saying, because I am those three things, I have a guaranteed ticket for heaven. A guaranteed ticket for heaven. And what did he end up saying? <laughs> Look at these words here. Amazing. Just amazing transformation. It should be clear that in God's eyes, there is no such thing as bias. In Psalm 106, we are reminded of other details of the Exodus the crossing of the Red Sea, and the craving for meat with its related terrible disease. He also mentioned the earth swallowing up Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. The psalmist also mentioned the golden calf, and he reminded them that God told the entire generation over the age of 20 that they were to die in the desert because of their rebellion. I... I, I try to put myself in each one of these situations. What would you say? What would you say to your spouse if you had just come back and you had just received the, the, the news that 
you were going to die in the desert. You were never going to get to the promised land. Well, let's hope the kids make it. I hope so. He reminded them of the terrible tendency of the, the children of Israel had to slip into the pagan fertility cult religions that were popular among, around them. And I, I wish that we had more details about the map of Canaan after they got into Canaan. If you remember that Moses said, this piece is for this tribe, this piece is for this tribe, and the entire area, the entire country was mapped out and supposed to be given to these people. But they did not go and conquer They them. didn't do it. No. They did not. They would settle, a group of them would settle in the middle of something, and so what we had is a, a, a bunch of Jews here surrounded by pagans, a bunch of Jews there surrounded by pagans, a bunch of Jews here surrounded by pagans, there in the patchwork, until the times of David, finally, they, they took care of all these pagans out there. And what and happened? Instead of the Israelites converting yeah. the pagans, the pagans converted the Israelites. Yes. That's, that came that's, as syncretism yes. to bind the religion. That's right. It? Yeah, yeah. Just so long, it's all right if you worship the pagan gods all week long, just so long as you get to the temple on Sabbath. But none, none of the northern kings did what was right in the sight Not of the one. Lord. Not one. Not one. Sad. Well, and in two different places in Psalms, Psalm 115 and 135, the psalmist talks about those who made and worshipped idols and the fact that they become like the idols that they were making. And mm -hmm. he, wasn't, he wasn't bragging about how good they looked, I can tell you. You know, these are the dumbest things I mean, how dumb do you have to be to cut up a log, use half of it for cooking your meal, and the other half you carve it into a god? And then bow down and thank it. Yeah. <laughs> Worship it. Worship. Try to become like it. <laughs> okay, Psalm 106. Bible study guide says, Psalm 106 also evokes the major events of, in Israel's history, including the Exodus sojourn into the wilderness, and life in Canaan. It stresses the heinous sins of the fathers that culminated in the generation that was carried into exile. Thus, the psalm almost certainly was written when the nation was in Babylon or after they had returned home. The psalmist, inspired by the Holy Spirit, recounted for God's people those historical incidents and the lessons that the people should have learned from them. So here what we have an example of, okay, we know this story. I mean, everybody must have had at least a, a brief his, knowledge of these events, these major events of the Jewish nation. So what does God do? Okay, he gives the psalm, he says, okay, now, Maybe they know the stories, but maybe they haven't figured out what they're supposed to learn. So tell them what they're supposed to learn from these stories. I mean, you know. Well, in Psalm 106, the psalmist reminded the children of Israel that their behavior was no better than that of their forefathers. The main problem being that they did not seem to have learned anything from their forefathers' bad examples. And of course, we've learned all the right lessons and we're behaving all the right ways, right? <laughs> if only. And what about us? How much more evidence do we have? What are we doing with that evidence? I mean, we have the whole story of Jesus and everything that he taught and everything that the disciples and the apostles taught. And we're way, 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 way ahead of the ancient people, right? <laughs> we would never make any of their mistakes. Well, Psalm 80 recounts the parable of the Lord's vineyard. And Charles, I think you're, no, Jim. How are God's people portrayed in the Psalms? Yeah. Uh, right. Number 80. And what great hope do they plead for? And this is a, such a key pa passage. I've taken part of the Psalm and put it in here. You want to lead Psalm us through 80 that? Psalm 80 verses 4 to 18. How much 
oh, excuse me, how much longer, Lord God Almighty, will you be angry with the people's prayers? You have given us sorrow to eat, a large cup of tears to drink. You are the surrounding nations. Excuse me, you let the surrounding nations fight over our land and our enemies insult it. Bring us back, oh, Almighty God. Show us your mercy and we will be saved. You brought a grapevine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it in their land. You cleared a place for it to grow. Its roots were, went deep and it spread out over the whole land. It covered the hills with its shade, its branches overshadowed the sea, giant cedars. It extended its branches to the Mediterranean Sea and as far as the river Euphrates. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt for just a second. At what point in the history of Israel did they rule from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates? David. Only David. Only in the days of David and Solomon. Um, mm. Okay, go ahead. Why do you break down the fences around it? Now anyone passing by can steal its grapes and pigs trample it down <laughs> boy, boy. and wild animals feed it on. Uh, but wait, Turn, uh, is it they, they're accusing the Lord for doing... <laughs> What, what they failed to do, right? That, that's not unique to, the, to yeah. their, their thinking. It's, uh, wow. what, whatever is bad is happening is because God did it, as far as they're concerned. Okay, Look down ahead. from, excuse me. Wild pigs trample it down and wild animals feed it. Turn us, excuse me, turn to us, almighty God. Look down from heaven at us and come and save your people. Come and save the grapevine that you planted. This young vine you will make grow so strong. Our enemies have set it on fire, and so it cut it down. Look at them in anger and destroy them. Preserve the, and protect the people you have chosen, the nation you made so strong. We will never turn away from you again. Never Keep us that. alive, and we will praise you. And of course, that was carefully followed, right? No. <laughs> Never turn away from you again. And, and right? You think God's, he's, God needs their praise? Bring us back, Lord God Almighty. Show us your mercy and we will be saved. Wow. <laughs> but they don't understand that they don't want to listen. And so they, they make choices and they live, with the, live or die with the consequences. And you wonder, you know, how widespread, if a prophet showed up and came with a message, how many of the children of Israel got that message, actually heard that message? Was it just a few people in Jerusalem? Uh, was it the priests, all the Levites? Did they share it with people? Well, wouldn't it have been on all the TV stations and the internet and everything? Of course, of course. So everyone would hear it? Even to, to draw attention, one of the prophets, who was it, was naked walking around. Yeah, two, two, of, them. two of them. Two of them, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, hey folks, you notice yeah. anything? <laughs> I mean, you know, wow. what, what does it take to get people's attention? Right, right. It's, well, it, I won't go, go ahead. There. No. <laughs> From our Bible study guide, Israel is portrayed as a vineyard that God uprooted from Egypt, the land of oppression and transported to the promised land of abundance. The image of a vineyard conveys God's election of Israel and his providential care and some passages there. However, in Psalm 80, God's vineyard is under his wrath. What does that mean? He has to give up on them to a certain degree anyway. The prophets announced the vineyard's destruction as a sign of God's judgment because the vine has turned bad. Uh, Charles, you want to pick up Isaiah 5 there? Yes, if I can find it. Uh, number one. Now, how, how, what was the period of time between this David, if he, assuming he wrote that Psalm 80, I don't, didn't bother to check, was it David? I don't remember. And Isaiah. Is it five? Yeah. Isaiah five. Okay, oh, I'm trying to find it here. I've lost it somewhere. 500 and some years. Is that 19? Middle of page four. Middle of page four. Oh, great. Middle of page four. Okay, great. Okay, Isaiah five. You asked a question though, between- uh, I was Psalm asking 80? what time period? That most of the Psalms were written around the times of David. That right. would be about a thousand BC. 
Isaiah lived at 700 BC. Right. So 300 years more or less. Okay. Isaiah 5, 1 to 7. Listen while I sang, sing you this song, a song of my friend and his vineyard. My friend had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug the soil and cleared the uh, stones. He planted the finest vines. He built a tower to guard them, dug a pit to, uh, for trading of the grapes. He waited for the grapes to ripen, but every grape was sour. So now my friend says, you people who live in Jerusalem and Judah, judge between my vineyard and me and me. Is there anything I fail to do for it? There, that's why, then why did it produce sour grapes and not the good grapes I expected? This is what I am going to do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge around it, break down the wall that protects it, and let wild animals eat it and trample it down. Now let me interrupt for a second. Is this God saying what he's going to do? And if so, how did he do those things? Take away the hedge, break down the wall, let wild animals eat it, trample it down. Is that talking about the many times when other nations conquered Israel? Well, 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar comes and yep. destroys. That would, yeah. be, that would be about 100 years after Isaiah. Yeah. Okay, this is go what, ahead. Okay, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. All right. This is what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge around it, break down the wall that protects it, and let wild animals uh, trample it down. I will let it be overgrown with weeds. I will not prune the vines or hold the ground. Instead, I will let bran berries, briars. Uh, briars and thorns cover it. I will even forbid the clouds to let rain or fall on it. Wow. That's a pretty serious situation. <laughs> Most of that is in permission rather than it says, I will take away the hedge. It will, the hedge will be broken down and yeah. it doesn't, God doesn't need to be the active agent in that. He yeah. just, you know, let, let you do your thing. Yeah. Make a mess out of things. Go ahead. Israel is the vineyard of the Lord Almighty. <laughs> yeah. The people of Judah are the vines he planted. He expected the, them to do what was good. But instead, they committed murder. He expected murder. them. He expected them to do what was right, but their victims cried out to for justice. Wow. Mm. However, the Psalm however eight. Psalm eighty, I can pick that up okay. there. However, Psalm eighty does not ponder over the reasons for a divine judgment. Given the depths of God's grace, the psalmist is perplexed that God can withhold his presence from his people for, um, for such an extended time. The tension between God's wrath and judgment on the other hand, on the one hand, and God's grace and forgiveness on the other, causes the psalms to fear that divine wrath may prevail and consume the people completely. Wow. Okay, let's pick another psalm to look at. Any comments about that one so far? 135, verses 3 through 21. I'm just curious, very yeah. quickly. So David and others wrote these psalms. When did the scribes do it? Or maybe he himself did. But was it read, do you think, to the people from... Some of them were sung. Some of them were sung as hymns in, in, in the, the hymns. temple or around the temple. But they were singing this stuff and yet they didn't click in their heads. Yep. Wow. Yep. Psalms 135, starting with verse 3. Praise the Lord because he is good. Sing praises to his name because he is kind. He chose Jacob for himself, the people of Israel for his own. I know that our Lord is great, greater than all the gods. He does whatever he wishes in heaven and on earth, in the seas and in the depths below. He brings storm clouds from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the storms and he brings out the wind from his storeroom. 
interesting uh, analogies. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, he killed all the firstborn of people and animals alike. There he performed miracles and wonders to punish the king and all his officials. He destroyed many nations and killed powerful kings, Sihon, king of the Amorites, Og, king of Bashan, and all the kings in Canaan. He gave their lands to his people. He gave them to Israel. The gods of the nations were made of silver and gold. They were formed by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, and eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear. They are not even able to breathe. May all who made them and who trust in them become like the idols they have made. Wow. Mm. Praise the God, praise the Lord in Zion, in Jerusalem his home. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, okay, in what way do the people who make idols become like their idols? <coughs> when they die. Mm, I don't well, think just when they die. They, they become essentially mute, deaf to God's, um, to God's uh, will for them, God's communication with them. Yeah. They don't listen. Yeah. Well, if you, I mean, if you are creating a piece of wood or even metal, whatever it happens to be, or stone, and you carved it yourself, how much intellectual, whatever you want to call it, do you expect to get from that? So what do you expect from yourself? You can, you can do whatever you want with this chunk of whatever. It's just, it's just unthinking. What really blows my mind that they witness, they see supernatural happenings that cannot be explained, and they turn. Yeah. Well, our, our, our neighbors have a king. Give us a king. Yeah. We want to be like our neighbors. They have the idol, so we're going to uh, worship another idol. In Psalm 135, the psalmist reminds us that God has full control of the forces of nature. Okay, which idol made out of wood, stone, metal, controls nature? Not a... I mean, you know, how clever do you have to be to sort of figure that out? He guided the children of Israel in the defeat of all the kings of the Amorites. And all those, those kings were giants and seemed to be invincible. They were easy prey for God when the children of Israel followed his directions for battle. Thus, Psalm 135 praises God for delivering his people from Egypt and helping them to conquer their enemies in Can Canaan. I mean, I, I, you know, how, I mean, it should have been so obvious that God was helping, that God had helped them and did all this. How could it ever, how could that ever sort of <clears throat> escape their attention? Well, God spoke of Israel as his special treasure. Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 11, Exodus 19, 5 and 6, and 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. I guess I, Gordon or Myra, okay? Deuteronomy 7, 6 to 11. Do this because you belong to the Lord your God. From all the peoples of the, on earth, he chose you to be his own special people. The Lord did not love you and choose you because you outnumbered other peoples. You were the smallest nation on earth. But the Lord loved and wanted to, to keep the promise that he had made to your ancestors. That is why he saved you by his great might and set you free from slavery to the king of Egypt. Remember that the Lord your God is the only God and that he is faithful. He will keep his covenant and show his constant love to a thousand generations of those who love him and obey his commands. But he will not hesitate to punish those who hate him. So now obey what you have been taught. Obey the laws that you have been given today. Good News Bible. Okay. Now the next passage is from Exodus 19. Where are we in the history of the children of Israel in Exodus 19? just before the Ten Commandments. Yes. So we are camped at the, foot, at the of foot of Mount Sinai, and God is giving them instructions about how to receive what he's going to give them from the top of the mountain. And what did he say to them in preparation? Exit, yeah. go ahead. Oh, 
You want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. Now, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people, a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. Wow. I think another place does say a kingdom of priests. Uh, another translation. They were supposed to be. They were supposed to be priests to the whole world. Right. Yeah. Not only Levites. Levites were among them, but yeah. priests to the entire world. In the New Testament, Peter used that same language to talk about the Christian church. And look at this passage: First Peter two nine and ten. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. At one time you were not God's people, but now you are his people. At one time you did not know God's mercy, but now you have received his mercy. And who is he, who is Peter writing to? Who is Peter writing to? And you remember? Well, it's not just openly, you know, Paul sort of directs his, his letters to specific things. But Peter is apparently writing to all the Christian churches in Western Asia Minor, which would be Turkey in our day. And, he, and the primary membership of that group were what kind of people? Gentiles. 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 And what is Peter saying to them in these, the in these Gentiles passages? Gentiles are God's chosen people. You have the same promises given to you as the children of Israel had when they came out of Egypt. Egypt. Of course, does that apply to us today? Oh, what well, it does, listen. <laughs> what does that mean? It, mean, it mean? it meant or means that the children of Israel and Christians in modern times have had and have a special relationship with God. And that relationship is called faith. And if they follow or fo followed or follow his guidance, they would have been, would have been, or will be blessed in all that they did or do. Okay, the Bible study guide there. Where are we? Are what? Jim. Not Jim. Jim. The recounting of God's great deeds on behalf of His people, Psalms 135, 8 to 13, culminated in the promise that God. Uh, will judge his people and have compassion on them, Psalms 135:14. The judgment here is God's vindication of the oppressed and the destitute, Psalms 9, 4, Psalms 7, 8, and Psalms 54, 1, and also Daniel 7, 22. The promise is that the Lord will uphold his cause, up will his people's cause and defend them. Deuteronomy 32, 36. Thus, Psalms 135 aims to inspire God's people to trust in the Lord and to remain faithful to their covenant with Him. And this is one of the things that we very often misunderstand. We are so used to, uh, at least here in America, we're, we're used to a system in which if you go to a judgment, if, you, if you're called by a judge and you have to appear before the judge, you, you just sort of automatically assume something bad is going to happen, right? You pay a fine, you do whatever. But in God's judgment, He judges everybody and some people are rewarded for their good behavior. That's what it's talking about here. It's not just, not just everybody who appears before God so and is condemned and loses their life or whatever, go to prison or whatever like that. No, the focus in, in God's case is he wants to save as many as possible. So it's not just condemnation. That's a, that's a separating process. Yeah. Separate those who will listen from those who don't want to listen. They go yeah. their own way. Okay, Charles, you want to pick up with Psalms 9 there? Sure. You, God, are fair and honest in our in your judgments, and you have judged in my favor. Notice that, in my favor. In my favor. Go yes. ahead. And this is Psalms 9, is probably David writing. Yeah. You are the judge of the whole human race. Judge in my favor, O Lord. Save me by your power, O God. Set me free by your might. 
Deuteronomy 32, 36, the Lord will rescue his people when he sees that their strength is gone. He will have mercy on those who serve him when he sees how helpless they are. Okay, so the emphasis here is God is judging people in favor of his people. Right. Psalm 135 tells us that there is no comparison between the idols worshipped by the pagans and the almighty powerful God. Yahweh, the God of Israel and of us. Review the speech of Stephen recorded in Acts 7. Okay, do you remember Stephen was called before the Sanhedrin and he's speaking up for Christianity and he does a marvelous review, really, of, you know, the, the history of Israel. And Paul's summary of faithful people in Hebrews 11. As a result of that speech, Stephen was stoned to death. You give a marvelous sermon and guess what happens? You get stoned to death. They didn't want but, to listen, did they? No, <laughs> but Paul's conscience was awakened and it, I, I, you know, again, I, I, I probably shouldn't stop and do this often, but I, I have to. What do you think Paul will say to Stephen when he gets to heaven? <laughs> that, that, that would be a good one to watch, like with Isaiah and, and uh, Manasseh. Yeah. yeah how about a, David? A, and David Uriah. and Uriah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's going to be some absolutely marvelous situations there. Wow. <laughs> and Stephen, oh, wow. Well. <laughs> and they'll all say, I don't remember anything bad happening, <laughs> yeah. even though we know the facts. It's recorded in the Bible. Yeah. It all worked out. But Paul's, and, and, and the people who suffered in those circumstances will say, when it was all done, it said, we know the truth, but it worked out. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Paul's conscience was awakened and he ended up spending his life preaching the gospel to Gentiles and finally having his head cut off. <laughs> I mean, what was the end of that? Head cut off. As Seventh-day Adventists, we need to do the same thing that God challenged the people of Israel to do in ancient times. We need to review and learn from our history. Gordon? Ellen White in Life Sketches said, we have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. Okay, Isn't that how, very how? similar to what some political leaders subsequently have said and Churchill, gotten credit right? for it, Churchill especially? Oh, yeah. I think yeah. so, World War II. Yep. Yeah, and then Bible study guide. For God's people to go forward fearlessly, they need to know the facts of their history. Ellen White, advises believers to read Psalms 105 and 106, quote, at least once every week, end yeah. quote. And there's the passage. I looked it up so we could look at it. Testimonies to Ministers says, the experience of Israel referred to in the above words by the apostle and are recorded in the 105th and 106th Psalms contains lessons of warning that the people of God in these last days especially need to study. I urge that these chapters be read at least once every week, Ellen White said. Wow. So, and the purpose of reading them once a week would be? To remember. Do you think, do you think we should learn something? <laughs> remember the past and take wow. the lessons. How well, think of, we go ahead. How easily we forget. Yeah. Think about your personal experience with the church and with God in the 21st century. Ask yourself these key questions. One, uh, go ahead, Myra. One, what, is, what are the blessings of remembering God's faithful leading of his people in history? What are the consequences of forgetting or ignoring the lessons of the past? How can we apply the same principle to us as a church called to do the same thing that ancient Israel had been called to do? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Number two, how do the Psalms encourage us to recognize God's providential care in our life and to exercise patient and patience and trust in God's sovereign ways, even when it's not easy to understand why things are happening as they are? Number three, how can we make the study of 
the history of God's people more prominent in our personal and communal worship services? How can we be more intentional in telling our children about the more recent history of God's people? Would we dare, as pastors and church leaders and Bob, um, maybe a little bit more Sabbath school leaders, would we dare to say, okay, here's the history of ancient Israel, and here's our history. Would we dare to do that? What could we possibly learn from ancient Israel? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you think there might be, maybe God was involved somehow? <laughs> then and now? Yes. So what should we have learned from this lesson? The, the Holy Scriptures from our Bible study guide, the Holy Scriptures are not a book of philosophy filled with human conjecture regarding God's attributes and teachings. The Bible is the Lord's action in human history from the beginning of time. Through these events, we may learn who He, who he is and what, he, what His plans are for humanity. Many critics of Scripture stumble on this biblical truth. They cannot accept the idea that God is working in human history. They reject the notion that the Creator is involved in human affairs. To acknowledge His involvement would be tantamount to admitting that He is the ruler of the universe and the rightful Lord and Sovereign of every human being, and as such we must accept His kingship and His, kingship and his law. The last thing the selfish heart wishes to recognize is God's chains upon his or her allegiance or divine authority over human life. I mean, to put it very simply, they don't want to face the fi a final judgment conducted by God. I mean, what would happen if God judges you? You might have to be held up to accountability, right? The Bible is full of stories. It is really his story, or his story, his, his story, <laughs> God's story. These stories are not just for our entertainment or for the entertainment of our children. They are the backbone of Scripture. Jim, this is a marvelous statement. I, I really love this one. In the annals of human history, the growth of nations, the rise and fall of empires appears to as dependent on the will and the prowess of man. The shaping of events seems to a great degree to be determined by his power, ambition, or caprice. But in the word of the Lord, of the God contained as drawn aside, and we behold behind, above, and through all the curtain, excuse me, and through all the play and counterplay of human interest and power and passions, the agency of the all-merciful one silently, patiently working out the counsel of his will. Ellen White, Education, page 173. Wow. Can we read, read, for example, the conflict of the ages series from patriarchs and prophets all the way down through great controversy, and can we, using that sort of little help, and in connection with the Bible, can we see God's hand working step by step by step by step down through history toward a final culmination that's coming very soon? Have we been getting better or worse? Hmm. Uh, Gordon, you have didn't we have gotten that closer that. to God over time or further away? Well, what I can say is that at some point in time, God says, I am going to have a people, and they will be faithful to me, and they will stand up against everything the devil can throw at them. Are you ready? Hope so. And I believe that day is not too far. Not far. These stories are meant to teach us about God. What we learn about Abraham and Moses and David, those are interesting things. But the real story is about whom? God. God. From Genesis to Revelation, we see the story of redemption. Everything the Lord has done has been the, for the purpose of saving lost souls. We see the purpose 
in the content of the Bible itself. It is a book of history of salvation, while 21 books of the Bible are narrative of in nature are uh, composed of stories. The remaining of the books, whether prophecy, poetry, wisdom, apocalyptic the uh, literature, pastoral or personal episode, all also relate to or contain story stories of history. And now that again should say his story. Story, right? <laughs> that there it is. Yeah. The scriptures, their entirety are based on the understanding of their author is alive and moving through or intervening in earthly events. The power of the Bible's message resides in the fact, in, the, in this fact. When we learn, for instance, that God controls the seas, the winds, the bird, big fish, the vine, the worm of Jonah's story, we know that these four chapters are no mere novella of an obscure nature writer uh, scrawled thousands of centuries ago. If the Bible teaches us anything, it is that the Creator rules over nat nat natural forces then and now. Remove the historicity of the scripture and we will have religious tales without the power of the or impact of our current lives. Unfortunately, this situation is just what we see transpiring in our society today. Bible denounces such secular thinking and affirms that, that not only does the Lord work in history, but He also has dynamic and salvedic uh, relationships with His creatures. So again, all of that history is supposed to teach us lessons that will bring us closer to Him and to not make those same mistakes again. Gordon? More from the Teacher's Bible Study Guide. An interesting feature of the scriptures is that historical events are often narrated in the form of poetry as well as in prose. So both. We usually have this preconceived idea, no doubt conditioned by the study of secular literature within our given culture, that history should be written only in the formal style of prose. In most societies today, poetry is reserved for the expression of emotions and is not considered the suitable domain of serious writing or for the subject matter of historians. So songs and, and uh, poetry alike. Huh? Mm -hmm. But the Holy Writ defies any such literary restriction or classification. Just compare Exodus 14 and 15. Both chapters talk about the miraculous parting of the Red Sea, but use different literary forms to do so. The account in chapter 14 is rendered in prose, while the account in chapter 15 is rendered in poetry. We find the sem same technique employed in Judges 4 and 5, in the record of the victory of Deborah and Barak over Jabin, king of Hazor, and his armies. Chapter 4 is written in prose, while chapter 5 is rendered in poetry. The comparisons between the prose and poetic accounts of the same events are instructive. We should not dismiss historical events in the Psalms as less than, quote, historical or authentic simply because they are rendered through poetry. Poetry is a legitimate form of expression that the Bible writers used under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to appeal to and affirm the faith of the believers in God's actions. Okay. Very good and very provocative uh, mm -hmm. uh, paragraph there. Yeah. And I would mm -hmm. like to remind us, which we are probably aware of, but we sometimes forget it, that it's easy for us to see all this, you know, poetry stuff especially. We see them talking about cows and we see them talking about wild animals and the sea and so forth like this. But it's talking about really people and so forth like this and God and so forth. And somehow we need to see it in that context. As one might guess, the story of the plagues in Egypt, the Exodus and all that God did for Israel and the central theme of much of this discussion. And why would the children of Israel be talking about those things? 
You think those were important in their history? <laughs> that theme was repeated when the children of Israel were brought back from Babylonian captivity, reestablished themselves in Canaan once again. And you would think, okay, now God's did this twice. We went into captivity. We got, God brought us back. Hmm. What are we supposed to learn here? <laughs> Again, these stories were intended not just for our entertainment, but also to, we are able to learn from them and teach them and the, and the lessons they teach to our children. And Psalm 78, verses 2 to 4, I will open... Huh? Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark, and, dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. In other words, what are we doing? What are we trying to do? Teach. Teach, Teach them. Let them see from these previous experiences that are spelled out in Scripture the lessons we should. So I'll let you read that next paragraph. You've got about a minute and a half. Okay. In ancient Israel, parents educated their children by reciting to them the actions of, God, of the God of their forefathers. Time after time, the command is given to parents to repeat these deeds of salvation, the slaying of the firstborn males in Egypt, the miracles of Exodus, the crossing of the Jordan River to their children. Such recitation uh, involves more than simply memorizing statements and laws. Rather, implicit in this form of education is the idea that the strong grasp of his history is the best way for the next generation to preserve their parents' faith. Now I'm going to ask you a question now. Try to picture yourself as one of the students in the schools of the prophets. Do you, sorry, Myra, you would be left out. <laughs> but I mean, don't you think they probably sat around and say, okay, look at this story, let's read the story. What does it mean to us? What's it supposed to mean to us? Surely they must have done that. Surely it must have done that. Well, Exodus 13, 14 to 15, and 16 says, in the future when your son asks what this observation means, you will answer him. By using great power, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, the place where we were in the land. It's time to pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these lessons that have been prepared with such care by people who have spent a lot of time trying to put the whole story together. Help us to learn the lessons that were missed by our ancestors, our spiritual ancestors so long ago. May that not be our story, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.